Good morning. morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Bristol Community Church. I'm Pastor Gary Lewis. Great to have you with us today. Hey, just wanted to begin with a word of appreciation to all those who donated candy for our uh, egg hunt yesterday. We had over, we had 3,000 eggs for our kids. And so we had about 40 children. They all got a bunch of eggs. One of the parents said, this is the most generous egg hunt in Elkhart County. <laughs> so thank you for doing that. Thank you for being a part of all that. Just a quick, a few announcements. We're having a Holy Thursday or a Monday Thursday service at 630. And no, there will not be foot washing. Quite a little discussion at staff meeting about foot washing, let me tell you. <laughs> and so we're just going to have communion on Thursday, all right? at 6.30. And then also Good Friday, we're having a a Bible study at noon on Good Friday. So far, we have two participants uh, registered. So please, if you'd like to participate, let us know. I will send you a Zoom link. We'd love for you to be involved. It's just going to be an opportunity to share and to learn more about the crucifixion of Jesus and the events of Good Friday, and we can pray for one another and be together. On Sunday morning, on Easter Sunday next week, We are going to have an expanded coffee hour. So at 8.45 a.m., come and enjoy some coffee and some special goodies and some fellowship at 8.45 in the Family Life Center before we have, this is, I guess you could call it the Easter edition of coffee hour. So we're going to have a little half hour before the service for Easter Sunday. Uh, Please uh, pray for those that's in the bulletin involved in our HOPE initiative. We've got some folks who are who are praying and being involved about becoming Great Commission Christians, so please pray for them as you take a look at them. Now, Christians all over the world are celebrating today what is known as Palm Sunday. That is why we have palm branches to remember this entry into Jerusalem. This is when, in his own unique, humble way, Jesus decides to make a declaration. It is Passover, and many Jewish pilgrims arrived in Jerusalem. Now was the time to make full and an open proclamation of his identity. Now, as I read these words in, in the Gospel of Mark this morning, Hosanna means, please save us now. The events of Good Friday changed the mood of the crowd, as we know. And on this day, though, there was hope for a political Messiah to free them from the clutches of Rome. So here is what is known as the triumphal entry from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 to 11. If you're able, would you stand for the reading of the word? As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord needs it and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches that they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. Pray with me. Come, Holy Spirit, come. 
Help each of us to hear the stones cry out to us. A message of praise to our Lord. Help each of us to find the courage to speak and to affirm the central identity of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, one of the things that I enjoy doing the most as a pastor is to receive new members into our church family. And we recently had a membership class. And we've got a couple of new folks that uh, they're not new, but they've been here a while. But they have stepped across the line and are becoming a member. Would you welcome Don and Marion Monroe? You guys stand here and just face the crowd. Do you believe in God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit? If so, say, I do. I do. do you confess Jesus Christ as Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to, to serve Him as your Lord? Can we say amen to that? Amen. Every time I read that, I get chills. Do you hear this public confession of faith? what that means for all of us. Do you receive and profess the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures? If so, say, I do. I do. do you promise, according to the grace given you, to keep God's holy will and commandments and walk in the same all the days of your life as a faithful member of God's holy church? Will you be loyal to Christ through the Global Methodist Church and joining with your brothers and sisters around the world, do all in your power to fulfill its mission. If so, say, I will. I will. Will you be a faithful member of Bristol Community Church, doing all in your power to strengthen its ministries through your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness as Christ's representative in this world? If so, say, I will. I will. Welcome. God bless you guys. Thank you. God bless you. Let us all stand and join in praising our Jesus Lord. His name is wonderful. everybody.
Okay, let's all join in singing praise to the Lord the Almighty. Unfortunately, the words aren't printed on the top of the page, and I don't know what it is. So this is the one we're singing. <laughs> Please. 
Good morning. Good morning. I'm uh, Georgie Nicodemus, the pastor of family and children here at Bristol Community Church. Pastor Gary told me I should introduce myself in case people don't know me, so that's who I am. <laughs> um, let's be in an attitude of prayer as we pray this morning. Father God, we ask your Holy Spirit to inhabit our service this morning. Let your word be a refreshing to our spirit. Father, as we reach out to you this morning, as our hearts seek you, let us feel the weight of your presence. Pour out your spirit among us. Let us encounter your Holy Spirit living in us, guiding us, opening our hearts to your truth. You, Father, are the Lord God of hosts. You are the sovereign ruler over all things. You are over all creation, and all creation serves your purpose. Father, I ask that you be with those who are brokenhearted, for you are close to the brokenhearted. You rescue those who are crushed in spirit. Bring peace where peace is needed. Father, we are confident that you know the things that are on our heart. You are the strength of our very being. You know our needs and our concerns. Learn us, teach us to trust you, to bring all our cares to you. Comfort those who are going through tough, uncertain seasons. Father, you are our strong tower. You are the pillar that holds our life. You are our refuge. You, Father, are our strength. You are Jehovah Rapha, God who heals. Father, we ask for healing for those in our midst who are ill. We ask that you continue to be with Donna Rex, who is recovering from, sick, from hip surgery done earlier this week. We pray for a quick, complete recovery. We continue to lift Jean tomorrow in our prayers as he continues to heal from neck surgery. We are, thank you. we are thankful for his presence here this morning. We pray for Ruth Zeems, who is currently in hospice care. Father, we thank you for unity of spirit and a church that is Christ-centered. The Bible says, ask and you shall receive. Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name as we pray the prayer Christ gave to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom done come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
This morning's Bible reading is from Luke chapter 5, 17 through 26. One day Jesus was teaching, and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat, and they tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered his, him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friends, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisee and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew that what they were thinking, and he asked, Why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, We have seen remarkable things today. Amen. Thank you, Georgie. If you'll turn to your bulletins, there's a sermon outline inside. There'll be some Bible verses we'll be sharing together this morning. It is sad to know the number of Americans living with some sort of paralysis. The leading cause is stroke, followed by spinal cord injuries and multiple cirrhosis. While not as devastating as being physically paralyzed, many more Americans are emotionally paralyzed. You can be paralyzed by fear, you can be paralyzed by worry, you can be paralyzed by grief, by loneliness, by hidden anger or resentment. You can be paralyzed by indecision. You can be paralyzed by all kinds of emotional situations. When you are emotionally paralyzed, you feel, my life is out of control and I cannot change. You feel helpless and hopeless to change your situation. Today we're going to, to look at a story in the Bible of a man who was radically changed by Jesus Christ. These principles that we see from his life will help you understand how God changes you. This story is so important, it is recorded by three different writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So obviously, it has some lessons to teach us. The Bible tells us this in Luke, Luke chapter 5. One day Jesus was teaching, and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Now, this means it was a standing room only audience. Uh, people were, were crammed into this little house. And the Bible goes on to say, some men carrying a paralyzed man on a mat tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and, and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. The man we are going to look at today was literally paralyzed, physically paralyzed. But the three things that Jesus said to this man are the three things he says to you and to you and me when we come and honestly say, Jesus Christ, I want you to change me. They are the three things that will help you break free 
from emotional paralysis too. We are in a season the church calls Lent, a time of spiritual preparation for Easter. The story of Easter, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, is a story about grace. Grace describes the unmerited favor God has for each of us because of what Jesus did on the cross. It is a supreme gift from heaven. How does God change me? This is the question we're going to look at today. Grace is a fuel that drives change. This story illustrates for us how grace works to create change in us. If you said to Jesus, I want to change my life, he would do the same three things in your life that he did to this paralyzed man lying on a mat. Number one, grace defeats our fears. Imagine this scene. Jesus was in a packed room, standing room only crowd. All of a sudden, he hears some noise above his head. He looks up. The, the roofs in, in Palestine were flat. He, he starts seeing some stuff crumble down on him. Pretty soon, the tiles are removed, and there's a gaping hole in the ceiling. Four men peer down at Jesus. And then all of a sudden, they start letting a man down on a stretcher. They let this man down until he is right in front of Jesus, right in the middle of his sermon, right in front of everyone. Now, that is what I call an interruption. How would you feel if you had been that paralyzed man? Embarrassed? Fearful? Anxious? This, by the way, shows how desperate this man was to be changed. He allowed his friends to tear up the ceiling and publicly let him down in front of all these people, stopping Jesus in the middle of the sermon. All because he wanted to be changed. This is how desperate he was. Desperate. When Jesus looks at him, he does not say, excuse me, I'm busy. You're interrupting me. Notice what, it, what Jesus says It's in, in Matthew 9, verse 2. It says this. Let's read this out loud together. It's in your, your sermon outlines. Let's read that out loud together. Some men brought to him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Be encouraged. Cheer up. Do not give up. Do not be afraid. It is okay. You are not bothering me. The first thing Jesus does is to ease this man's fears. Why? Because he cared about how this man felt. If you feel worried, frightened, insecure, or anxious about your future, Jesus cares. Whenever God breaks through in the Bible, it usually begins with, don't be afraid, fear not, be encouraged, cheer up. You see, fear is a universal problem. We do not like to admit our fears, but everyone in this room has their private insecurities, private anxieties, private phobias and fears. What are you worried about this morning? Your health? Your future? Your finances? Your relationships? Your children? Your past? Your future? Is it the problems and pressures of life right now? Jesus understands those and he says, let me ease your fears. If you have all these fears, and you do, you have anxieties, worries in your heart, if you push them down, that is called depression. Depression is usually frozen rage or frozen fear. The Bible says this in Proverbs 12, verse 25. It says this. Let's read this one out loud together. It's up on the screen. Anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. That is exactly where Jesus starts. He gives him an encouraging word. Grace defeats our fear. 
allow me to give you an encouraging word. I don't know what you're going through, what you are facing this week, what you faced last week, but I do know this, God does. And God cares. God can help you and God's first word to you is, do not be afraid, I can handle it. What do you do with your anxiety? You give them to Jesus Christ. You put them right where they belong, beneath the cross of Jesus. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 says this, For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. The Bible says perfect love casts out all fear. Why is that so important? Because fear is a universal problem, and fear is what keeps us from getting close to God. Fear is what keeps, keeps us from being closer to God. This is the starting point for personal change, understanding the deep truth of how much you are loved by God. The first thing God does in your life is ease your fears. Grace defeats our fears. Number two, grace turns guilt into gratitude. Grace turns guilt into gratitude. Notice the second thing Jesus says to this paralyzed man in Luke 5, verse 20. He says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Now, wait a second here. I want you to notice a couple of things. First, he did not come to Jesus asking for forgiveness. He came for healing and Jesus looks at him and says, your sins are forgiven. What is going on? Well, the second thing to notice is, is it says, Jesus noticed their faith. Not just the faith of the paralyzed man, but the faith of his friends who did so much to get him in this crowded house to see Jesus. You see, Jesus looks beneath the surface issue, the man's paralysis, and deals with both the physical and emotional issues. He looks at this man and sees he was physically paralyzed, but he knew he was emotionally paralyzed too. This man was paralyzed by his past, like many of us are today. You cannot get going into the future because you are stuck in the past. You are stuck over the guilt about things you have done to other people. You are stuck with resentment about things others have done to you. What happens is we can be stuck in the past, we cannot get on with the present, and we certainly cannot move on into the future. So Jesus comes and deals with the real issue here. He says, friend, your sins are forgiven. Most of the world is dying to hear three words. You are forgiven. Most of the world is, is dying to hear those. Why? Because we have all blown it. We have all made mistakes. None of us is perfect. We all need forgiveness. Guilt is an incredible, paralyzing emotion. It robs you of energy. It robs your strength and joy. It destroys relationships. It harms our bodies. Our bodies were not meant to carry a load of guilt. You say, should a follower of Jesus Christ ever feel guilty? Yes, for about 10 seconds. That is how long it takes to recognize you blew it, that you have sin in your life, and then confess it to God. Admit that it is time for you to change. God does not want you carrying around a load of guilt all the time. Jesus Christ came to defeat your fears and to turn guilt into gratitude. Gratitude for the redeeming work Christ has done on the cross for you. Here is the truth. All of us have blown it. We are all imperfect. I do not measure up to God's standards. I don't even measure up to my own standards, much less God's. We all need to know how Jesus Christ forgives. The Bible is very clear about that. It's on the back of your outlines. First, Jesus Christ 
forgives me instantly. God is merciful and quick to forgive. You see, when someone hurts us, we want them to suffer a little while. We want them to feel it. We want them to, to grovel a little bit. When my daughter was little, Dad, I'm so sorry I did this. I go, you know, I, okay. I kind of, you know, wanted to grovel a little bit, right? That's just our, our nature. But Jesus never makes us wait. He never delays. He never says, I'll think about it. The moment you ask for forgiveness, it is instant. Second, Jesus Christ forgives me completely. That means every sin in your life. He has forgiven all your sins and has wiped out the evidence of broken commandments which always hung over our heads. He has completely annulled it by nailing it to the cross. Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross and your sins were nailed to the cross with them so you can stop nailing yourself to the cross. It is forgiven. It is instant. It is, instant. It is complete. And third, Jesus Christ forgives us freely. In other words, you will never be able to earn it. You will never be able to deserve it. God's forgiveness is a gift. God says he will accept us and acquit, acquit us and declare us not guilty if we trust Jesus Christ to take away our sin, no matter who we are or what we have been like. Did you notice when Jesus looked at this man, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven? Jesus called him friend. I do not care what you have done in your life. Jesus Christ wants to be your friend. This means God wants you to have a relationship with you. God wants to have a relationship with you. It is so important that you learn to understand that Jesus Christ forgives instantly, completely, and freely. Because if you don't, every time something bad goes wrong in your life, you're going to start thinking, mm, God's getting even with me. Or when something goes wrong, you're going to say, God is punishing me for what I did. No, that is not true. This is what the cross is all about. This is what Easter is all about. Jesus forgives instantly, completely, and freely. The only logical, rational, and responsible response to this truth is utter amazement. Complete amazement and gratitude that God loves you that much. Grace turns guilt into gratitude. Grace replaces our guilt. Grace overrides our guilt. Grace overwhelms our guilt. Grace overpowers our guilt. It changes forever how you view the world. When I think about myself, William G. Lewis Jr., knowing me as I do and knowing my past, I am amazed that God would love and, for, and forgive a heart like mine. If you come to Jesus Christ honestly and say, I do not want to be the same anymore. I want to be a different person. I want to change. First, he will defeat your fears. Second, he will turn your guilt into gratitude. And third is where the real change starts to take place. Number three, grace displaces are doubts. Jesus takes doubt out of the equation by displacing it from the front and center location it has in your heart. Doubt is like having a large screen TV following you all around everywhere you go and broadcasting in HD all the bad things you have done. Doubt will overtake you and ruin your prayer life and your fellowship life with God. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus says this to the, to the crowd. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So, so he said to the man, I tell you, get up, 
take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Jesus asked this man to do the very thing he has been unable to do his entire life. This man was dependent upon others. He had been carried everywhere he had gone his entire life. There were no wheelchairs in those days. So everywhere the man had been in his life, somebody had carried him. Jesus looks at him and says, I want you to stand up and take up your mat and go home. You are healed. Why in the world did Jesus do that? He asked him to do the impossible. Why? He wanted to stretch his faith. You see, faith is not something, not just something you believe. No, faith is something you do. Faith is not something you think about. It is something you act on. Faith is not an opinion or a conviction or a philosophy. Faith is an activity. It is obeying God and doing what God says to do, even if it seems impossible. What is God asking you to do that looks impossible? God is testing your faith. Grace displaces our doubts. God says, are you going to trust me? Are you going to place your faith in me? Here's the good news. When God asks you to do something, that's God gives you the power to do it. The moment that man on the mat decided, the very second he decided to get up, after Jesus said, get up, God gave him the power to do it. What change in your life seems impossible? Jesus Christ specializes in those kinds of situations. He is the God of the impossible. In many ways, each of us in this room are like the paralyzed man. You may be paralyzed by depression. You may be paralyzed by envy, indecision, worry, shame, guilt, or fear. You feel like, I am stuck in a rut and I don't know what to do. It does not help just knowing that Jesus Christ can defeat your fears and erase your guilt and enable to do what seems impossible. It doesn't help knowing that if you do not do anything about it. If you decide not to act on it, knowing it can be done makes no difference. It makes no difference that, that Jesus forgives instantly, completely and freely, unless you take action. <coughs> what you need to do today are the three things that this paralyzed man and his friends did. The three steps to renewal. First, turn to Jesus Christ. They could have just stayed home when Jesus was in town. No, they turned to Jesus Christ. I am sure that this man had seen many doctors over the years and was given many therapies, treatments, and possible cures to no avail. He was probably deeply discouraged. It is human behavior that we usually turn to everyone else but God first. We think, I can handle this problem on my own. I can make this marriage work. I can handle this habit. I can do this. No, you cannot. Finally, when we hit bottom or run out of options, we say, maybe I will try God. Save yourself a lot of pain and turn to Jesus Christ today. Second, you must believe Jesus Christ can help you change. This man would not have put himself through this embarrassment, allowed his friends to put a hole in the ceiling and drop him in front of a bunch of other people if he did not believe that Jesus Christ could and would change him. That is important but it is not enough just to believe he can and will change you. Third, you must do what he tells you to do. Even if it seems impossible, it is a test. 
It is stretching your faith. It is a matter of trust. It is a matter of obedience. Jesus looks at the man and says, get up. I want you to leave this room and go on home because you are healed. Impossible. But he got up. He did it. The moment he decided to do it, as soon as he stood up, his arms and legs were filled with strength he had never had in his life. He did what he had never done before. Question. What would have happened if this man had not done what Jesus said to do? What if he had turned to Christ, believed he could help him change, but did not obey him? He would still be lying on that mat. So, what about you? What about you? Pray with me. Oh, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for something that has happened thousands of years ago that has direct impact on us today. So, Lord, today I would just, I would just ask you to work in the lives of these people who are hearing my voice. And that, Lord, that you would give them the grace that they need to change, to make changes in their life. That they would recognize that grace is the fuel for change. And that because of Jesus, grace defeats our fears. Because of Jesus, grace turns guilt into gratitude. Help them to understand that Jesus forgives instantly, completely, and freely. Help them not get caught up in this guilt cycle and not able to move forward. And Lord, help them to know that because of Jesus, grace displaces our doubts. Help us, Lord, to take doubt out of the center of our lives and instead to put trust in you in the center of our lives. Would you pray this prayer with me? Would you just say it, just say it this way? Say, dear Lord, I, I don't understand it all. But I come to you today knowing that there are changes I need in my life. I want to become what you want me to be. I want to be more like you. I want to experience your grace each and every day. Would you just pray it this way? Would you say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Help me to repent, to turn away. And help me, Lord, to be encouraged to make the changes I need to make in my life. Give me the strength that I need by the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. And help me to begin with a renewed relationship with you. Help me to tune out all these contradictions in the world and instead to focus on you. May this Resurrection Sunday that is coming next week be an opportunity for, for me to rejoice in a renewed relationship with you. Friends, if you prayed that prayer, I believe in all my heart that God heard your prayers and God knows your needs. Oh, Lord... Thank you. Thank you that you are here with us always. And that your love remains steadfast. Help us to grow in your likeness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, I'll ask our ushers to come forward as we prepare for our tithes and offerings. And I just want to remind you about the communication slip that's in your bulletin. There's a little perforated area there. Uh, please tear that out and record your t your attendance if there's a prayer request you might have we pray for that as a staff every week so take a look at those i'm gonna offer a prayer as we get together for the offering allow me to pray almighty gracious god lord jesus we thank you for your word and we pray your blessing on these tithes and offerings help them lord to 
to strengthen our church and to strengthen our witness to the community. We thank you for all these children that we get to minister to, Lord. And we pray your blessing on every one of them. Help them to come to know you and help these tithes and offerings to make that happen. For all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join us in singing Where He Leads Me.
Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen and amen. I'll be right up here. If you'd like to have a word of prayer, feel free to come forward. I'll be in the front pew or at the altar rail. You're welcome to come.